Howdy y'all. Welcome to part four of my What is PragerU series. If you haven't seen the first three videos, they're linked in the description, but you don't need to have seen them to enjoy this one. Now it's no secret that PragerU content has always been targeted towards kids and teens. They've made some attempts to deny this, saying in recent videos that the five minute video series was always meant for adults, but this is demonstrably false. They have playlists on their website with titles like for the whole family, and new releases for teens. And the marketing campaign has always focused heavily on teenagers. But the five minute videos have always been watched by adults too. And it's hard to imagine many little kids are actually watching them. Most kids would rather watch a video about like Spider-Man than progressive income tax, you know? But PrayU refuses to let any demographics slip out of their reach. And thus, in 2021, they launched PragerU Kids, an offshoot of the PrEP program that consists of content specifically targeted towards young children, and they're pouring a lot of money and effort into creating as much of it as they can. According to their 2021 annual donor report, PragerU spent $4.3 million on PragerU Kids last year, with 42% of that being on production. To put that into perspective, the production budget for PragerU Kids is about half of that for all other PragerU content combined. So they're really trying to quickly build up a massive catalog. And it's working. In the past two months, the PragerU Kids channel has released 26 videos. They currently have five separate kids video series, with a sixth one on the way. They've released eight children's books, and they've created a variety of kids magazines and activity pages. And because I love nothing more than being thorough, we're going to be taking a brief look at all of them today. But before we delve into the content, we first need to meet the face of PragerU Kids. Now obviously, the face of PragerU as a whole is Dennis Prager, but the director of outreach for PrEP and PragerU Kids is Jill Simonian. Jill spent most of the past few decades working as a TV host and contributor on various local news stations mostly doing parenting advice columns, because if you couldn't tell by her Twitter handle, Jill Simonian, the fab mom, is in fact a mommy blogger. I didn't look much into her blog, but it seems to just be normal Christian mom fair. Though there are a few notably conservative posts, like a very proud statement on having an in-person Thanksgiving during the pandemic, where she weirdly invokes her deceased mother while talking about how COVID deaths don't particularly concern her. But all this made her a perfect fit for PragerU. She loves conservative politics, and they love D-list celebrities. With that out of the way, let's look at some PragerU Kids content. To start, let's look at the How To series, and the video How To Be Reasonably Green. Yeah, in case you forgot, uh, PragerU is funded by fossil fuel billionaires. Do you use too much stuff? Too many paper towels? Too much hot water? Too much toilet paper? Well, then you should stop. Being conscious of the environment is an important part of being a good citizen. That being said, some people unfortunately go a little nuts on being green. Let me turn down the thermostat. It's a little, it's a little warm. It's warm in here. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully nobody actually does that. But there are actually many ways to be green without going crazy and actually save money in the process. So here are five ways for you to be reasonably green. So yeah, this how-to video is essentially just recycling a bunch of personal level be green advice that you've been hearing from plenty of outlets for decades. Stuff like turn off electronics when you aren't using them and clean up litter. Plenty of people have pointed out that this type of singular action, while still good, is ultimately ineffective at combating climate change because of the systemic pollution on the part of big companies and getting most of our energy from non-renewable sources. And while this is a fair point, PragerU is well beyond even the individual solutions will solve climate change mindset. Because besides exclusively talking about individual actions, they also brush away any concern about climate change as hysteria. But what you should not do is panic. 
the world is not going to explode into a flaming ball of charcoal because you used a plastic straw. Seriously, man? What about the turtles? <clears throat> and their section on buying local seems more focused on hating China than caring about the environment. It saves shipping containers, boxes, and energy spent on transporting items overseas, and helps by supporting Americans in your community. Mm, who doesn't want that? Also, ah, uh, communism. Uh, there's that. Chinese. You know, you, you try not to support them. Y'all know stuff is manufactured in China because it's cheaper, right? Outsourcing manufacturing to countries with lower labor standards isn't communist. Anyways, this video is latching on to the genuine concern over climate change and riding the wave of be green sentimentality, both to get easy views and to make Preview look slightly less like heartless leeches sucking all the money they can out of the fossil fuel companies that are ruining our planet. But of course, fossil fuel funding and a general habit of being wrong means they can't actually care about climate change. So the how to be green video becomes less about protecting the environment and more about how bad, crazy, and wrong some people are for wanting to. The series includes other videos like how to not be a screen addict, an odd choice for an organization that is constantly publishing online content, and how to prep for a job. These videos combine issues kids might actually sort of care about with what academics have termed Haha ha, random XD humor, because they hope to be something of an onboarding tool for PragerU. If you watched How to Deal with Peer Pressure, you may go on to watch the rest of PragerU's catalog. The second series I want to take a look at is TBH History, because if there's one thing that the kiddos love, it's acronyms. TBH History is a series of around 10 minute videos on various historical events, and in case you're wondering, Yes, there is plenty of haha -ha random XD humor in this too. Oh! Walnuts! I hate walnuts! Ah! Oh! Ah! It's in these videos that we get an idea of how the people at PragerU think history should be taught. It should be incredibly sanitized and should paint their beliefs as the best. Their video on the Industrial Revolution, for example, neglects to mention things like child labor and the environmental impacts of coal power, but does credit laissez-faire capitalism as the primary reason Britain was the first country to industrialize. And while it was certainly a reason, Britain also benefited from the agricultural revolution, allowing for less people to need to work producing food, a vast, easily accessible supply of coal, advantageous geography, with plenty of rivers for easy transport of materials, relative political stability, and, oh yeah, the largest colonial empire in the world, giving them a massive amount of natural resources. You can absolutely give capitalism some credit for the Industrial Revolution, but to pretend it was the only thing is pretty dishonest. A sentiment that PragerU would seem to agree with, because their video on the American Revolution starts like this. Look at this photograph. What do you see? From this perspective, it looks dark and depressing. But look what happens when we zoom out. A very different picture emerges. A lot of people treat American history like this photograph. They zoom in on one particular part and build a fancy frame around it. This one piece is what American history is all about. But you will miss out on seeing the whole picture if you only focus on one small part. Or in other words, you need accurate perspective to make accurate conclusions. Despite opening part one, talking about looking at the whole picture, over the course of two 10 minute videos, there is no mention of slavery. Seriously. The closest we get is a passing reference to Martin Luther King Jr. When it comes to teaching American history, especially to kids, I see a lot of people say that you can't go into too much detail on the negative aspects because it's not age appropriate. But omitting the unsavory elements of history gives kids an incomplete view of historical events. You can't ignore history just because it's inconvenient. Conservatives wail endlessly about political correctness, but this right here is the single most widespread example of political correctness in the country, the refusal to acknowledge the negative aspects of American history. 
The reason for American independence is written off merely as taxes and tyranny. And while those were principal, you almost never hear about the concern over the British inciting slave revolts and enlisting Native Americans to fight against the colonial government. This was a big enough grievance to make it into the Declaration of Independence. And with over 25,000 black soldiers estimated to have served across both sides of the Revolutionary War, it's actually harder to ignore them than to include them in your historical account. PragerU's recount of the history is severely weakened by their political bias. When the most you're willing to go against the Founding Fathers is that they weren't literally perfect, without going into any details as to what was imperfect about them, you aren't going to be able to produce anything that can accurately be called TBH history. For our third series, we're going to look at the craft show, Craftery. This is one of two shows hosted by Jill Simonian, and its shtick is giving out dubious history lessons and then doing a craft, which they definitely found on some parenting blog. Craft! Welcome to Craftery by Prep, PragerU resources for educators and parents. We've got crafts, history, and your questions. I'm Jill, and today we're making an American apple pie in a microwave. You know, I get accused of hating America by conservatives on occasion, and all I have to say is that if I really, really hated America, cooking an apple pie in a microwave would be my first choice for expressing that hatred. That aside, we've got the craft, where's the history, and our questions. What's that? We've got a question. Why do people say as American as apple pie? Was apple pie created in America? Good question. The answer is not really, but sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the answer is no, and the finished product looks about how you'd expect. Soggy, undercooked, Chef Ramsay would be furious. But bad pie I can excuse. Bad history I cannot. Let's take a look at the MLK Day video, the I Have a Dream No So Pillow. Because as we all know, Martin Luther King Jr. only said one sentence in his entire life. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. His dream came true and continues to live today. Despite how comfortable it makes conservatives to pretend that it has been, MLK's dream is far from realized because MLK's dream went beyond technical equality under the law. Martin Luther King's push for economic equality in the form of things like reparations and job guarantees goes wholly ignored by conservatives because the things that King wanted are the same things that they despise. It's dishonest and disrespectful to reduce MLK to one quote and a fucking pillow. But Prager You Kids isn't just made up of videos. There's also several collections of activity pages, biography magazines, and global issues magazines. The activity pages are all pretty barren, even for the target audience of five-year-olds. The Virtue of Patriotism activity, for example, consists of a Dennis Prager coloring page and a Star coloring page. And the Virtue of Freedom activity consists of a Ronald Reagan coloring page and Reagan trivia. The hypocrisy of using the man who kicked off mass incarceration to represent the virtue of freedom does not seem to occur to them. Well, frankly, those are just boring. So let's check out the Global Issues magazines. This series takes a look at the lives and experiences of imaginary kids in various countries around the world. We're going to take a look at the one set in Venezuela. Can you guess what they're going to be talking about? If you guessed socialism, don't give yourself any points. Of course they're going to be talking about socialism. So yeah, if you've ever seen a Time for Kids or National Geographic Kids magazine, this is sort of in the same style. Very colorful, lots of drawings. The only difference is that the primary aim of the PragerU magazine is leading kids towards adopting a hardline anti-leftist worldview. 
To summarize the position presented in the magazine, they claim that Venezuela was prospering thanks to the help of foreign oil companies until the government, quote, decided to try socialism and nationalize their oil industry. Socialism is defined by them as a system where you are not allowed to own anything individually and the government controls what everyone can buy and own, which is not what socialism is. They then claim that since only the smart foreign oil companies knew how to manage the oil, that the economy failed, ignoring both that the price of oil fell sharply at the time and that the state-owned petro company was still partnered with foreign oil corporations and structured to run as a business. So if the supposed expertise of the foreign oil companies was so valuable, they sure didn't show it. They then advanced to the election of Hugo Chavez and pin the second oil-related economic crisis on a combination of overspending and overdependence on oil, which were both factors, but there's no mention of any economic sanctions by the US, nor any acknowledgement that an overdependence on oil is not inherent to socialism, or that Venezuela is not in actuality a socialist state. The rhetoric of a nation's leader an individual is largely irrelevant to what economic system the nation as a whole actually implements. Like with most conservative talk on Venezuela, the concern seems less about the people living through this crisis and more about blaming socialism. And then, at the end, there's an activity page and a recipe for a rapist. Yeah, kind of a tonal shift. I mean, I love Miguel Cabrera and all, but not exactly what I'm expecting after reading eight pages of ranting about socialism. The final set of children's magazines are the biography magazines, and I think you can tell a lot about what these are like just by looking at the people they chose to feature. Margaret Thatcher, Amy Coney Barrett, Andrew Jackson, Ayn Rand, Condoleezza Rice. It's pretty much just a list of historical figures who did horrific things, and contemporary figures that agree with PragerU's politics. I decided to read the one on Cornelius Vanderbilt. It seems that the conservative obsession with defending the ultra-rich doesn't only apply to the living, because PragerU complains that Vanderbilt was maligned as a robber baron by many modern historians. And in the glossary section, they define malign as to make evil, harmful, and often untrue statements about someone. So they're calling historians who criticize Vanderbilt evil liars. And of course, reading the account PragerU gives, Vanderbilt is presented as a bootstrap-pulling icon, rising from a relatively poor background to being the richest man in the US through seemingly just elbow grease and good business decisions. Although curiously, the magazine makes very little mention of Vanderbilt's time as a rail tycoon. There's only one little passage at the end devoted to that. They describe his rise to rail dominance as such. During the 1850s, he began investing in railroads, buying stock, and ultimately acquiring multiple railroad lines in the Northeast. If that seems like a pretty sparse account, that's because it is. Purview opts to leave out the part of the story where Vanderbilt shut down the rail bridge that all the other railroads relied on, waited for their stock to drop, and then bought their stock and took over. I don't think you can get more hostile takeover than that. Again, we're seeing PragerU rewrite history by leaving out the parts they don't like. They want to promote the idea of Vanderbilt as a great person, because to them, he represents the greatness of capitalism. But they can't pretend he's perfect and admit he engaged in hostile business practices, so they just don't. They want to fault socialism for the failure of the Venezuelan economy, but they can't do that honestly, so they ignore the oil prices falling, they ignore the US sanctions, and they ignore that Venezuela wasn't and isn't actually socialist. Earlier, I referenced PragerU's kids' books. Yes, PragerU is making actual real books that parents can buy and read to their unfortunate children. The series is called Otto's Tales and stars the titular Otto, Dennis Prager's dog, as the point of view character. Also featured is a child version of Dennis Prager. I'd say that's the weirdest thing about this series if it weren't for the giant Otto mascot costume that shows up in some of the videos. 
And the actual books are pretty strange too. I wasn't going to buy any of them, but they've made every book into a video, so I didn't need to. The videos are split into two categories. Original stories, where Otto and Dennis go back in time to historical events. These are the ones that get actual book releases. And stories that are in the public domain, that I suppose they just make videos out of in order to upload more content. This is stuff like The Tortoise and the Hare, The Pitcher and the Crow, and George Washington and the Cherry Tree. It's all very cheaply animated, and I'm not really interested in taking a look at it, but the original stories have a variety of choices, from Today is MLK Junior Day, which contains more lies about MLK, to Today is 9-11, where Dennis Prager goes back in time to 9-11. To do what? Why, to get a view of New York from atop the Twin Towers. <laughs> what? You know, most time travel stories that go back to 9-11 try to prevent it, but I guess Dennis just wanted the first-hand experience. We aren't going to be looking at those, however, because I just couldn't resist Today is Columbus Day. Most of the videos are narrated by Jill Simonian, but this one features a guest narrator. Noted fucking liar and genocide denier Michael Knowles. Regular viewers of the channel may remember the video I did on his video about Columbus, and in this video, most of those talking points are repackaged for a child audience. It begins with Dennis and Otto celebrating Columbus Day when they decide to travel back in time to meet Columbus. We landed in Spain in 1492. Christopher Columbus was about to sail the ocean blue. I'm a Christopher, he said. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Knowles commits to the Italian accent for the whole video. He even does it for the king of Spain, weirdly enough. We want to send you on more voyages, not just two, but three. Just unbelievable. The actual story focuses mostly on how Columbus was such a big brain genius navigator who stumbled across a place he didn't know existed and extracted a bunch of wealth out of it. But because PragerU is so committed to getting the whole picture, it also covers the negatives. And there were natives here who were of a different race. The settlers and natives got along quite a lot, but also had trouble with each other and sometimes they fought. Yeah, that is the farthest this story goes into the atrocities committed against the indigenous populations of the Americas. No mention is made of Columbus enslaving natives as soon as he made landfall, or the encomienda system of slavery the European settlers would institute. No mention of the rape that we know Columbus at the very least permitted amongst his crew, if not directly committed. No mention of genocide. One may argue that this would obviously not be present. This is a book for children, after all. But in case you forgot, they made a book on 9-11. So this series is not afraid to tackle difficult topics but rather it is afraid to question the dogma of American, and let's be honest, white supremacy that is integral to the US conservatives' worldview. Instilling that worldview is the point of the series, so Columbus is held up for what he represents to that worldview, as the ending of the book makes apparent. We honor Columbus for his courage, for being the first person to connect the new world to the old world of Europe, and for making America possible. The people he killed and the lives he ruined are irrelevant, as long as we're on top. God bless America. Finally, Prairie U Kids' flagship series is Leo and Layla's History Adventures. It stars the titular Leo and Layla, a brother and sister duo who have the same dead-eyed look as the fish for sale in a grocery store. Leo is the younger brother. He has blue hair and pronouns. And Layla is also there, I guess. I don't know. They're just props for right-wing talking points. Their personalities aren't really relevant. In the series, they travel through time to meet various historical figures, because apparently PragerU is lazy enough to use the exact same plot for two of their shows. Oh, but in Otto's tales, they use some random object to time travel, whereas in Leo and Layla, they use an app. So it's very different. In the first episode, the siblings are engaging in what I assume is the favorite activity of conservative children, 
telling each other trivia about Ronald Reagan. Did you know that Ronald Reagan was one of our most popular presidents? Of course I knew that. And did you know he was California's governor before he was president? Well, duh. Did you know that he started out as an actor? He starred in over 50 movies. Yeah, and he wasn't just an actor either. He was in the military during World War II. Hmm, you know what? He was actually great at a lot of stuff. He played college football. He was also on the swim team. He ran track, too. Plus, he was student body president. And he was totally handsome. Ew. Gross. What the heck, Leo? Yeah, apparently conservatives can't talk about Ronald Reagan without just constantly sucking him off. You are amazing, Mr. Reagan. You saved everyone's lives and made them better at the same time. Well, thank you, Leo. The rest of the episode is mostly just bragging about Reagan's supposed accomplishments citing Reaganomics and the Just Say No program as major successes, despite that being demonstrably false. And in case you're wondering, none of the Prairie View Kids videos ever cite a single source. The other video I took a look at was the Frederick Douglass one. It starts with Leo and Layla watching the news and getting upset over Black Lives Matter protests. They hear a protester on TV say, abolish the police, and because they don't know what the word abolish means, they travel back in time to meet Frederick Douglass, an abolitionist. Douglass is then used as a mouthpiece for PragerU to spout out their talking points, starting with the arguably slavery apologia that is the but there was slavery everywhere argument, disregarding the unique cruelty of America's racial slavery system. The sad fact is slavery has existed everywhere in the world for thousands of years. But it's especially disappointing here because America was founded on the idea of freedom. Yet so many black people are not free. And eventually moving towards congratulating America for being the first country to push for the end of slavery, despite that not being true. There was no real movement anywhere in the world to abolish slavery before the American founding. Slavery was part of life all over the world. It was America that began the conversation to end it. In addition to pushing their narrative on American slavery not being comparatively all that bad, PragerU makes sure to have Douglas write off the hypocrisy of the Founding Fathers. How can there be slavery in America when the Founding Fathers said that all men are created equal? Yeah, and I've heard that some of those Founding Fathers owned slaves. What about that? Children, our Founding Fathers knew that slavery was evil and wrong, and they knew that it would do terrible harm to the nation. They wanted it to end, but their first priority was getting all 13 colonies to unite as one country. The southern colonies were dependent on slave labor, and they wouldn't have joined a union that had banned it. If you're at all familiar with the speeches of Douglas, the phrase, Our Founding Fathers there, should be setting off some alarm bells in your head. Because in his most famous speech today, What to the Slave is the 4th of July? Douglas draws a clear distinction between white Americans, who were actually afforded the liberties the Founding Fathers spoke of, and black Americans, to whom those liberties were denied. To Douglas, they were not our Founding Fathers, but rather your Founding Fathers. To Douglas and every other African American, they may have been impressive, learned, committed men, but their promises reign hollow. And I know Prager you read this speech because they later misuse a quote from it. What's taking the southern states so long to do what's right? Great streams are not easily turned from channels worn deep in the course of ages. Huh? What I mean is, sometimes things are more complicated than they might seem, and complicated problems take time to solve. In the speech, Douglas is actually talking about how America, as a relatively young nation, still has a lot of potential to change for the better. Turning this quote into a reasoning for why emancipation took so long misses the point entirely. The episode ends with Douglas telling the kids that fighting for civil rights is okay, unless the people doing it are radicals, which the episode earlier defines as wanting a complete change of everything. Lost on PragerU is that in his time, Douglas was considered a radical, 
While today, I suppose we can distinguish him from more hardline abolitionists because of things like his willingness to meet with slaveholders and not joining the raid on Harper's Ferry with John Brown, at the time, abolition in and of itself was a radical movement. Getting rid of a widespread system of slavery is a major fundamental change, and any advocate for such an action was considered a radical. And I just can't get over how the moral of a story about meeting an abolitionist is Black Lives Matter is going too far. <laughs> now that we've taken a look at the content PragerU Kids has to offer, there's two more questions that I want to answer. What is the purpose of PragerU Kids and what is the impact of PragerU Kids? Let's start with the easier one, the impact. The PragerU Kids YouTube channel has about 5,000 subscribers. But looking at the views they get, you can't really tell. I've been checking their new uploads for a couple months now, and they'll regularly get less than 100 views on the first day. But while very few children appear to be watching PragerU Kids willingly, PragerU has never relied on willingness to put their videos in front of people. A video may get 80 views in its first two days, but on day three, that number will shoot up to 80,000 courtesy of PragerU Kids' over a million dollar advertising budget. Like always, PragerU is using their masses of billionaire money to artificially inflate their reach. The audience for PragerU Kids content may be small now, but the audience for any PragerU content was small in 2011, and now your aunt won't stop tagging you in Facebook posts about public schools turning kids transgender. The purpose of PragerU Kids is multifaceted. First and foremost, the purpose of any PragerU video is to instill a conservative worldview in the viewer. Facts are not relevant because the goal is blind faith and conviction that you're right. When no amount of evidence will stray you from your original opinion, their mission is successful. PragerU Kids also exists to onboard the youth. It reeks so very desperately of a bunch of old people trying to appeal to kids. The animated characters with wacky hair colors, the dog costume, the weekly live streams reminiscent of Saturday morning cartoons. They target kids because kids are highly impressionable. When you are someone's first introduction to any political thought, it's very easy to convince them that your position is the correct one. How many people do you know that are conservative or liberal simply because they grew up with it and view that position as the baseline? We previously looked at how PragerU's prep program aimed to turn parents against public education, and PragerU Kids is yet another facet of that push. They not only want kids removed from public schools, but also don't want them seeing normal kids' cartoons, which in recent years have become increasingly accepting of stuff like the reality that LGBTQ people exist, or the idea that racism is bad. In the interest of preserving their worldview, conservatives have decided the best option is not exposing kids to the scary homosexuals and anti-racists, and instead sheltering them in a safe space of right-wing rhetoric. If you know anyone who's bringing their kids up on this stuff, maybe kindly suggest they cut it out with the bullshit. While this stuff can seem benign, it gives children an incorrect view of what actually happened in history and can easily lead them down the path to some of PragerU's more blatantly horrific content. To any parents watching this, you're better off with Sesame Street. Elmo may be a little annoying, but he hasn't twisted the rhetoric of Martin Luther King Jr. as far as I'm aware. Thanks for watching, everyone. Like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, if you want to support me financially, you can donate to my Patreon and get your name listed with the lovely people that are scrolling by right now. The final part will be coming out soon, so hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when it drops. Uh, goodbye. That's my cat scratching herself. Uh, if you wonder what that noise was. Goodbye. <laughs>